Hello everybody, my name is Brandon Franklin and I'm going to be walking through one of my projects specifically through the lens of level design. This is a project that's been through many iterations over the course of about three or four years or something close to that. Uh, and it's kind of gone from like a student project to a personal project to a collaboration to all these different stages and all these different things we've learned about the design as we've gone through it. And I really wanted to look specifically at the level design because I think it is probably the part that's changed the most, and I think that because of the design of this game, the level design is particularly important to the overall game, because it's it's not really a typical sort of structure for a game, because in our game you don't really see anything, you can only see the environment when you actually paint on it, which means that things like leading the player to certain areas, things like having interesting things for the player to look at, are viewed through a very different lens, and I think that there's a lot, of, lot to learn about the, the level design through this particular project. So, uh, assuming that this doesn't crash my game, I'm going to go through and play a little bit of Canvas and kind of show off uh, the mechanics of the game a little bit and give you a better idea about how all these things come together. Okay, so as you can see, you start off here. You don't really have any ability to paint. You can sort of attempt to. Uh, you can kind of see uh, from the tree that kind of gives you paint over time, it sort of implies the colors that you're looking for there at the bottom. Uh, when you look at that apple, it falls down, and then when you interact with it, you gain the ability to paint. These are sort of just there for debug. I will just uh, get rid of those real quick, but those are just there for debugging the game uh, to make it easier. A lot of these things are sort of just to showcase some of the mechanics, so like these over here are sort of the equivalent of being near the tree and gaining your, gaining your paint back but these things will sort of do it in a spatially discoverable way. So you can go and find these in the environment and they will give you your paint back as you're exploring. And then, you know, you can tell that like just painting around in the environment is pretty useful in order to kind of let you know where you've been, allow you to explore more easily. So they reach over to this bridge section. You can tell that there are some, some strange things happening over there. You can kind of tell that the environment is a little bit more different than you might have assumed, getting a stronger contrast instead of it just constantly looking like it did out there. And then the player sort of comes up to this area. I really don't know why they're, it's all red like that. That's just That seems like it's just a bug that needs to be fixed. But normally that, that silhouette would all be white, uh, and then you would see the town on the horizon as well as this sort of... You can kind of tell based on the perspective that this path is sort of leading you there as you sort of progress out. And then over there is sort of intriguing, and that's your goal, so you kind of build your way over. As you're traversing, you kind of figure out that there is this, this little offshoot here. And as you paint that in, it will fill up, and if you fill it all the way up with red, then it will break. You can sort of just kick it down the, kick it down the mountain if you want. And then once you're down here, it's way more freeform about what you want to do as a player. Uh, you can sort of look back at where you've been, learn that there are some more things to discover up there, and look around. Uh, you can tell that there's this sort of this barrier right here that you can climb on and kind of get closer, but you can't quite reach across. Uh, and then you need to figure out, you can figure out what exactly is the way you get across there. All right, so I just gave the player some full paint so we can kind of show this other environment. So there's this mountain here that while you're inside of it, it blocks your view from a certain vantage point. So from where the player starts, they can't really see this environment, but once they look around, they'll discover that there's a mountain here and there's a whole separate path that they can go on. Uh, we got some more visual bugs here, which don't worry about that, they actually look kind of cool. That kind of shows uh, the player where to go, not the visual bugs, but normally the silhouette would kind of show the player that there's something over here. And as they work towards this uh, this sort of area over here, you start to see new landmarks. So up there, there's actually a way from the mines over to here, which is another shortcut. And then you can kind of see the sort of silhouette of the viaducts over there, which kind of draws the player eye forward. There are many different sort of puzzly areas here that you can backtrack and explore. But this sort of shows you, once again, it shows you the town that you're supposed to be going to. That is sort of the focal point of this level, is to try to get the player to solve the mysteries inside of that town and progress but then also falling down these cliffs will lead them back to the same area that the we had the player at before. So multiple paths kind of lead the player back around and they can make their way to the same sort of mysteries and the same sort of shortcuts that the 
the other path leads to. So now that I've kind of walked through the game a little bit, I'm going to go through and dive into each of these mechanics, each of these levels, the history of the game, and talk about each of those things one by one. Right now we know that this game is less combat focused, it's completely about exploration. Uh, we want to keep things simple and reuse elements as much as possible to make tutorialization less mandatory for the experience. Historically, however, there were a lot of different focuses that this game went down. So, for instance, here's uh, an example of our our itch.io page, which actually has a playable demo right now that you can play. It definitely has some bugs in it, but for the most part, you can kind of see that like a paint on the environment and reveal things structure was there. Uh, you can kind of see these gates that will allow you to travel between levels, and then there are elements of the environment that will interact with the paint. So once they get painted a certain amount, then they will animate and give you things like stairs, or uh, they will change shape and things like that throughout the demo. So for instance, here's level one from this demo. Uh, very simple. It starts you, I believe it starts you facing this little corridor here. You're facing this wall. And as you paint around, eventually you start to figure out, okay, I'm in a box. You figure out that there's area over here. So players start there, paint on the walls. The walls will lead them around here. And then eventually, no matter which wall you find, or even if it's a small enough environment that even if you don't really do anything except paint randomly, you'll eventually find this, this gate. Once you paint in the gate, it starts reacting to you and starts showing you that it's it's you know it's reacting to the paint. And then once it's painted in enough, it will send you over to level two. And then you can see that we're sort of messing with the player's expectations and giving them sort of environmental puzzles, like ways to have to figure out how to use the core mechanic of painting. I think that originally we were doing puzzles because it allowed us to explore the idea more so than it allowed the player to experience this mechanic properly. And we really had to go through this process of iteration and like figuring out uh, what people liked about this demo in order to really figure out what the next steps for the game was. So for the most part, that is the the puzzle design period for this game really just sort of fits into this one specific demo, this one specific 3DS Max file. I mentioned that the other one was very puzzle focused. We were kind of looking at traversal mechanics that were similar. But this is sort of me re-examining or what kind of game best suits this mechanic. I started sort of experimenting with what I thought was maybe the part that was lacking from the puzzle one, which is just that it's very interesting and fun, and maybe it's the primary engagement is being able to discover things that are being painted, which means that you need interesting shapes and you need interesting interactions in order to make people want to keep going. If the player wants to experiment and mess around, at some point they're going to run into the fact that there is a correct way that they're supposed to progress. I think that it's possible to do designs that are much more open, but like those games, like if it's more open in a puzzle game, it becomes less clear to the player, which is a, a pretty big detriment. If I go back over to the current state, you can tell that we kind of kept, we kind of kept this sort of structure, a sort of round structure that the player is meant to branch off from. I generally kind of plan this to be a hub world where if you paint in each of these or unlock each of these, then they will bring you to a different environment. Uh, and then I think at this time I was even thinking that that might be a good way to connect more puzzly levels together. But in the end, what we kind of move towards uh, is, as you can see, it's sort of freeform and explore the environment and you sort of you choose your own path based on your exploration more so than anything. Uh, rather than having sort of like a teleportation mechanic. A main point I want to get across is that you need an extensive amount of depth behind a game in order to really give cool levels that people enjoy exploring and looking into and, and living in for the amount of time that games usually ask people to experience certain areas. So I'm going to go through the current iteration step by step. I'm going to start with a slightly older version of the level and kind of talk about how I added layers onto it over time. Uh, and like why I added those layers to it and how things changed based on basically the needs of the project and how levels need to progress for the player to remain interested and have cool stuff to look at. Anything that we thought would be interesting to find or could add to the game, you just hide it somewhere. And that includes those things like the puzzles. Like there are definitely puzzles in this that if you are just sort of exploring one direction, you're not going to notice that you walked past a couple a couple of puzzles along the way. So let's get into a slightly older version of the level. So it starts with this sort of core environment and I can actually, I'll remove the edge faces for this to kind of showcase roughly how it looks for the player. Imagine this middle one being solid like these other ones and that's more or less what we started with. 
Uh, the reason why having the central point is there because it gives a strong silhouette for the player to constantly be aware that they're they're sort of uh, rotating around as they traverse. But it also gives us a way to present a big flat surface to hide certain things. So for instance, if I load in this first area, which is really this first area is what we started with. Uh, it would have just been the part around the tree, and then I sort of expanded out, and I realized that, okay, if we're going to have this, so we have this sort of uh, this ring here, and the ring blocks vision while you're within it, and it also blocks your vision from to the inside from when you're outside of it. And then we wanted to kind of make a macro version of that where this these mountains kind of do the exact same thing. If you're coming at it this way, you can't see the bridge, but if you're coming at it just right, then you have a perfect silhouette on this bridge here, and you can tell that there's something over there that you might want to explore. Like, so silhouettes are very important. I think that uh, with the town being like the focal point, as you can see here, originally it was a very boring sort of basic uh, environment. So if I go back over to the current version of the project, you can tell that the town has become quite plussed up from this from this phase. There's a lot more to do in it, which was sort of inevitably going to happen, but also there's a lot more interesting silhouettes and shapes to explore. So you can kind of see these round buildings here have more of a shape to them. There are a couple of those that you can kind of tell don't fit into the geometry of the rest of the environment. And then, of course, that the lighthouse has become this sort of big ominous thing that you, you're you intrigued by. It, it animates in the game and kind of like bobs up and down and you need to like work your way there. And so in order to have that kind of drive, which we didn't originally have, we sort of had this sort of basic environment that looks like this. It was supposed to be a much more down-to-earth town that people probably would have actually lived in. And you're sort of just there picking through the wreckage. But it's way more interesting to give them something fantastical to look at and a nice silhouette on the horizon to work towards. So if I remove that, the next thing is that there is a hidden level right beneath the other level. This is sort of our tutorial area that we think that most players will discover quite early on. They'll find their way into here just from exploring around the first area. It's right beneath it. There's this very clear path. You're going to see some interesting things here. Follow the path down. You'll find yourself inside of the cave. Even if you explore long enough, it's, it's pretty likely you'll find it. And honestly, the way that we've structured the game, we don't really mind if you don't find this path. I don't think it is incredibly detrimental to the game uh, to not find this little tutorial area. Keeping the player only focused on a few things at a time, especially new players, is really the best time to try to tutorialize because they don't really know the full depth of the game. They kind of get the premise, they understand why they're there, but they don't get how they get from uh, what they would have seen in like a trailer or what they would have read about on a Steam page. They don't know how to get from knowing literally nothing and getting to that point. So they're, they're looking for it, they're very clearly looking for some kind of thing to grab onto. And so giving just the proper amount of information to focus on will really direct the player into areas like this. So this is sort of a very traditional node level structure where it becomes linear, it breaks off into very uh, complex areas, and then it becomes linear again in order to make sure that the player uh, actually gets where they need to be going in order to progress and you don't waste their time and you don't confuse them too much. Uh, so there are a few offshoots here as well, like this area right here is being blocked by a boulder, which you can either, if you traverse this left path, you can unlock the boulder and find the hidden path, or if you traverse the right path, you can also find two separate ways that you might find to get into there. So that can do two things. It can show the player that there's something more in the environment. It can also lead to confusion because they don't know where they are versus where they were. As you keep painting, you're going to know that like this is an area that I've been and so those sort of problems kind of fade away over time, and I think that it's worth having that moment, that aha moment that players can get when they find something that they think they're kind of getting one over on the game. Even if it's placed there intentionally to kind of give them a hint, then they still kind of feel like they're getting one over on you and they're finding something that they shouldn't have found, or that they're noticing something about the environment that has greater greater depth than they originally thought. And then once they kind of figure out this this tunnel, which the, the level will eventually funnel them to as they sort of discover where they have been and where they haven't been, so there should be sort of like a gradient of paint that goes from the start to the end. And even if it takes them a while to figure out the environment, they're constantly being funneled. And this kind of leads to the general philosophy of the level design, which I've taken from John Romero, who is the he was the person that was the level designer on the original Doom game. And his methodology was that you you work through the level, start to finish, 
the way that the player would be going through it. And then as you play test it, you kind of figure out these areas that need more. They need more interest. They need more complexity. They need something to keep the player's attention during these parts that might need to be there for traversal. So for instance, getting the player this far away, so from the starting area and then the final area being the town, there needs to be some kind of space there just to make it feel earned by the player because otherwise they could just make, like if they can make a beeline for it, then it's you've kind of failed as a designer because you need to make sure that your level is interesting and a point A, point B traversal is not very interesting. That point A, point B structure, which is like you start here and you're trying to get here, means that there needs to be little little filters that the player has to pass through. So originally this idea was just that we have this big mountain. The quickest way to get the player to kind of get that aha moment and start working towards the goal is to sort of funnel them there. So they, they, notice, the, they notice something over here, right? They've seen a mostly featureless game up to this point, but this will be the first feature they see after leaving the cave, or even if they decide not to go into the tunnels under under here, they're going to see that. That'll draw their attention, and then they go over here and pass through a tunnel originally. It was just point A, point B, tunnel, and then you get to the the gazebo, which gives you the focal point of this area over here. Through playtesting, it was pretty clear that that tunnel is not very interesting to pass through. There isn't a lot of player agency or player choice going on there to just basically funnel them to this final point. And so I started to think about a way that we could do a shortcut because this sort of takes a long time to backtrack through this because you would need to climb up this whole mountain, you would need to cross the river, you need to walk from the town if you were walking backwards. And it's not really that we want to encourage backtracking, but I think to some extent, because we have hidden environmental upgrades, like all the in upgrades, all the puzzles are all environmental and spatial, then that means that the player is going to inherently be looking for areas that they missed once they realize that there are a lot of things that they missed. So the first time they go through, they might get there with not enough resources, and then they're going to have to backtrack and look around the immediate area to find more resources and sort of progress that way. So we need to give a lot of hints about ways or other areas that they can backtrack and also have things like shortcuts to save them time. So for instance, like this, uh, this mine area here sort of came out of a necessity. So we need some we need some shortcuts, and then we also need to hollow out this interior in order to give the player something to look at from this from this rope bridge. So instead of being a tunnel straight through the mountain, it's now a rope bridge that connects two tunnels, two smaller tunnels. And then from here, you can see that there's a lot more depth inside of here. There's more to discover over here. And if the player notices that, then when they get over to this side, the gazebo, get down here, realize they don't really have the resources or they're running out of paint, they're going to start thinking, what are the other areas that I can go to and uh, and unlock new uh, upgrades and new equipment in order to easily traverse or not have to walk back and, and recover my paint as much. So that's sort of been the philosophy of the, the level design is to keep adding points of interest at places that seem to be missing uh, something something that really draws the player's attention. So that sort of level design process that's sort of built up over time I think it really shows that like what you need is you need to have all the levels should be kind of on top of each other in one sense, either literally or sort of just figuratively in the meaning that they sort of take up a similar area. Uh, and you need to have these silhouettes that draw the player to certain areas. You really want each of the levels to be uh, intentionally separate when you really want something as like a challenge. So for instance, this town here, it's very intentionally separated in order to give the player a challenge that they can see they need to complete. Also, kind of the learning the layout over time saves you time. Uh, paint is sort of analogous to time in our game, so like because the amount of paint you have degrades as you use it, and so it's sort of the same thing as the player optimizing their time if they're optimizing their paint, which means that to encourage that sort of behavior in the level design is really important because if you want to go from point A to point B, you're looking about saving, you're looking into saving time, but you're also looking into saving the primary resource of the game, which is sort of analogous to a health bar in most other games. Uh, shape, color, height, and contrast are all really important as well to learning the environment because the shape really informs the player what something is before they can actually interact with it, and that really determines what how, the information they're going to be using in order to uh, progress. So color, to some extent in our game, is more about... Initially, it's all about having this sort of flat, binary, black and white, and that gives you these silhouettes and this information 
but the color that the player chooses to use on certain objects, as well as the colors we use in order to gate the player, kind of show the, the mechanics of the game in a different light. So the way it's balanced right now, the player will get more red paint than anything else. Uh, and that is to both give them uh, something that they can constantly be looking for and kind of be their bread and butter of, I like, I look for the red paint canisters, I have a lot of red paint, so I use it a lot. And then these other colors, the green and the blue, are going to be more tightly constrained so that the player can start to engage with the mechanics that those colors have with greater depth. So the red is sort of the bread and butter for exploring and finding new environments and, and sort of like breaking down barriers. And then these other two colors can have their own unique mechanics associated with them. And the making their resources more constrained really adds to how the player plays the game. It sort of trains the player to use their bread and butter uh, paint and then be looking for these unique situations where they use these more complex mechanics over time. In our game, as well as other games, awareness is something that is interpreted, not really given. So in our game, it's more of an extreme because you literally can't have awareness without spending some time exploring. But in most games, that's true as well, and usually that the level design is a big part of that. There's always hidden dangers. There's always, like, enemy placement becomes a really important thing. So one way or another, like, the awareness of your environment is something that you earn as a player. It's not something that's a given. So our game really wanted to to double down on that that realization and that mechanic that most games have and sort of present it in a way that's more exploration focused instead of a way that's more combat focused the way a lot of other games use that or trap focused or puzzle focused and all those games kind of have some way for you to kind of you learn the internal logic of a new area or you learn the internal logic of an environment and you kind of need to build off of that having multiple paths is also really important when you're trying to encourage a sort of freeform exploration uh, and, and keep encouraging the player to keep doing the thing that they want to do as opposed to trying to figure out what you, the designer, are telling them to do. Uh, that's another really important thing to keep in mind when you're focusing on exploration, and it's sort of something you want to discourage when you're doing something like a puzzle game. So that's sort of a, a big leap forward for the level design of this game is realizing that the idea of exploring and the idea of constraining the player's possibility space are two very in-contrast ideas. Okay, so that's really all of the mechanics of the game and how they tie into the level design in the game. Uh, really, the important thing to keep in mind, as I've said a couple times, is that you want to have as much depth as possible in the game. And for instance, we've done four years of iteration. That is a great amount of depth that is baked into the levels. It's baked into the mechanics. We've learned a lot from going through that. And I think that's something to keep in mind is that all games, as you're making the levels and making the mechanics over time, you really are trying to figure out the best levels and the best mechanics for your game and how to encourage the player to engage with them in a fun and interesting way. Uh, that's just sort of a natural part of game development. It's something that most of the stuff that I see online about level level design doesn't really touch on, is the fact that level design isn't just making a cool space and making cool uh, visuals, but it really is like, in, if without the mechanics, the level designs don't have any purpose. They don't have any sort of weight to them. So you really need to think about all the ways that you can kind of marry those things and give both the mechanics more depth, the challenges and environments that the player goes through. So I hope that you learned something from this. It was really just an exercise in kind of showing the process of level design over time and kind of showing how the development process sort of in informs level design on a project. Uh, so hopefully you learned something and I'll see you next time.